Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rouse IS. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. An answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of UPSC examination. Today we are going to take up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 30th of July 2020. The articles which we are going to take up are displayed on the screen. Let's now begin the discussion. Here is an important announcement. In our weekly series of mains question assignment from DNS, the question for today's assignment is India and European Union, although natural allies, find it difficult to arrive at consensus over finalization of free trade agreement. Highlight the major issues creating the roadblocks in such an agreement. This question is created from the DNS of 15th of July and you may watch the discussion before penning down your answers. However, there are few important things that you must follow. You can type the answer in the comment box or you can click the image or the JPG file and send your answers to us. All those who will send the answers by Saturday will get the evaluation and the feedback from Rouse IS teachers. Post your answers in the portrait mode only and also you should not post your answers in someone else's answers. Use the comment or post your answer at the bottom of the thread to submit your answer to the main thread and it should not appear as commenting on someone else's answers. Also you should try to keep a tab on time taken. Mention the time you take to write your answer on the top. You can also mention the city and state where you are posting your answers from. This is important because it will help us in knowing that DNS is reaching every nook and corner of our country. In the description of the video, there is a link for the question assignment where you can participate in the discussion on Rouse IS eLearn platform. All the very best. So the national education policy has been launched yesterday. It has brought about a unique set of reforms as well as the changes which were needed for a very, very long time. Now in this regard, three articles appear in today's newspaper to deal with the provisions of this policy dealing with the primary education and the other one deals with the higher education. Now as far as the UPSC syllabus is concerned, education has been directly given in GS2 syllabus in which it talks about issues relating to development and management of social sector, services relating to health, education and human resources. Now national education policy is one of the biggest reforms in education sector after right to education as the last policy for education was in 1986 and hence it becomes important for us to cover almost all the important points of this particular policy. Now another change announced by the government yesterday was that it has renamed MHRD that is Ministry of Human Resource and Development as Ministry of Education and henceforth this ministry shall be known by this name. So what we shall do is that we shall first cover the constitutional provisions related to education starting with fundamental rights, director principle of state policy, fundamental duties and also the section of special directives. Then we will understand the administrative setup as to division of the items related to education sector between union as well as the state. Then we will cover the important provisions of national education policy 2020 dealing with the reform of school education higher education as well as some other announcements which cannot be categorized into school as well as higher education. So let us now begin the discussion. So it is always a good idea to start with constitutional provisions regarding anything related to polity, social issues. You should be well aware of the articles and the provisions dealing with almost anything given in the UPSC syllabus. And since we are discussing education, it is important that we look at various articles and provisions related to education in our constitution. So starting with the fundamental rights. Article 15 talks about prohibition of discrimination on various grounds and this is applicable to educational institutions also which are partially or fully run by the state. And in that if you focus on clause 5 which was inserted by 93rd constitutional amendment, it talks about advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or the citizens from scheduled tribes and scheduled caste sections as far as that advancement deals with their admission to educational institutions including private educational institutions whether aided or unaided by the state other than the minority educational institutions given in article 30. So you can see that 
although this particular article is focused on advancement of education of a particular classes of citizens but nonetheless they are the ones who have been denied and hence it makes sense then of course article 21a which was inserted by 86th constitutional amendment of 2002 which talks about the right to education where the state shall provide free and compulsory education to all children of the age of 6 to 14 years in such manner as the state may by law determine and hence a law was enacted to ensure ground implementation of article 21a then article 28 although deals with freedom of religion but it also talks about educational institutions where freedom as to attendance at religious instruction or religious worship in certain educational institutions then cultural and educational rights of article 29 and 30 are very important because under clause 2 of article 29 no citizen shall be denied admission into any educational institution maintained by the state or receiving aid of the state funds on the grounds only of religion race caste language or any of them so these provisions have been included to ensure that no children belonging to a particular group of our society is deprived of education Similarly, Article 30 gives right to all minorities, whether based on religion or language, to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice. Then we move on to the Part 4, which is Directive Principles of the State Policy. In this, Article 45 and Article 46 talk about education. Article 45 focuses on early childhood care and education for all children until they complete the age of 6 years whereas Article 46 talks about promotion of educational and economic interests of scheduled castes, scheduled tribes and other weaker sections. Then we don't have to forget fundamental duties that is part 4a of our constitution where the subsection H talks about development of scientific temper, humanism and spirit of inquiry and reform which directly deals with the education. And then finally, the last fundamental duty talks about duties of parents and guardians to provide opportunities for education to his child or as the case may be ward between the age of 6 and 14 years. This was also inserted by 86th constitutional amendment of 2002. Then the next set of instructions related to education has been given in Article 350 and 351. So Article 350A facilitates or ensures the instruction in mother tongue at primary stage. It calls upon the state to make sure that every local authority within the state provides adequate facilities for instruction in mother tongue at primary stage of education to children belonging to linguistic minority groups. And Article 351 gives directives for development of Hindi language, according to which it shall be the duty of the union to promote the spread of Hindi language. So these were the constitutional provisions with respect to the education. But what about the administrative setup or what about the division of the responsibility between union and state? And as you know that that is decided by the provisions of the 7th schedule. So let's now understand various provisions of the 7th schedule to get a better idea as to whose responsibility it is to educate Indians whether it is state or center or both. So here we are with the 7th schedule. So as you know that there exists a set of universities known by the name of central universities for example Banaras Hindu University, Jawaharlal National University or Aligarh Muslim University. So any institution declared by parliament by law to be an institution of national importance comes under the purview of center and it's governed by the provisions of list 1 of schedule 7. Similarly, institutions for scientific or technical education financed by government of India wholly or in part and declared by law to be institution of national importance. For example, IITs, IIMs, Indian Institute of Science Education and Researches, NITs, Indian Institute of Science. So all these institutions come under the umbrella of central institution and they are governed by central government. Similarly, article 65 talks about setting up of agencies by the union government for professional, vocational or technical training including the training of police officers as you know there is a police academy in Hyderabad then it enables the central government to establish and run an institution for the promotion of special studies or research and it does the same for scientific or technical assistance in the investigation or detection of the crimes and similarly entry number 66 talks about coordination determination of standards in institutions for higher education or research and scientific and technical institutions and for that purpose you have a lot of organizations for example CSIR, UGC all have been set up and run by central government. 
so this is it as far as the list one is concerned so you can see that a very very small subset of overall education comes under the purview of central government or you can say the center which mainly deals with research higher education coordination collaboration and few central universities and now we move on to the state list where the entry number 12 tangentially talks about education because it gives the powers to the state to set up libraries, museums and other similar institutions controlled and financed by state. But this is the only provisions which directly gives powers to the states as far as education is concerned. And let us now look at the provisions of concurrent lists that is the list 3. Wherein the entry number 25 talks about education including technical education, medical education and universities subject to the provisions of entries 63, 64, 65 and 66 of list 1 which we have already discussed as well as vocational and technical training of labor. So power dealing with education has been given both to center as well as the state. Similarly entry number 26 talks about legal, medical and other professions. So according to this both center as well as state government can take necessary steps for development of legal field, health field as well as other professional fields. So we saw that list one, which is also the union list, demarcates the exclusive responsibility of the center government. Similarly, list two, which is a state list, specified the functions and responsibility which shall be performed by state governments. And list three is concurrent list, which specifies the joint responsibilities of center and state government. So in overall, the central government formulates the general policies and gives directions as well as the financial aids and responsibility of implementing these policies is shared by both center and the state. And as a furtherance of this policy making responsibility which has been given to the center in our constitution, the government has come up with this new education policy 2020. So let us now begin the discussion on the provisions of National Education Policy 2020 dealing with the school education sector. Now first and foremost it is important to know that this policy aims for universalization of education but this universalization of education is not new. You already know that through RD the education has been universalized but that is the school education. But a watershed moment in India's education scenario is that this particular policy will aim to universalize education from preschool to secondary level with 100% gross enrollment ratio by 2030. By attempting to achieve this, National Education Policy 2020 will bring 2 crore out of school children back into the mainstream through open schooling system. Also, the national education policy is going to replace the current curricular structure which is based on 10 plus 2 setup. So you can say that current curriculum is fragmented into two parts till class 10 standard and then 11th and 12th. But now the government is going to break down this curricular structure into four parts which will be named as 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. The first five years shall be 3 to 8 years. Next 3 years will be 8 to 11, then 11 to 14 and finally 14 to 18 years respectively. Now the rationale given by the government is that this will bring hitherto uncovered age group of 3 to 6 years under the school curriculum, which has been recognized globally as the most crucial stage for development of mental faculties of child. Now you might ask that what about the initial preschool education where that shall be given and that shall be given in Aganwadi centers which have already been opened up by the government. Now under this new curriculum there is going to be few foundational changes in the way we educate our children. Now if you are reading newspaper you must be following the reports on education released by an NGO called Pratham and the reports are known as ASAR. And you must have seen that how the students of class 5 were not able to solve the mathematics and vocabulary questions of class 2. Which means that there is a lot of deficit in our educational achievement and hence under the new education policy a special emphasis shall be laid on foundational literacy as well as numeracy. So now you can see that how actions of non-governmental organizations impacts the functions of the government. Because had it not been for the rigorous and the serious attempts made at formulating these reports, our government policy making would not have focused on the foundational numeracy and literacy. Also, the government is going to do away with the rigid separation between academic, 
extra curricular as well as vocational streams in schools and vocational education will be started from class 6 in all the schools along with the internships now continuous evaluation as well as the training of teachers is equally important and hence national curriculum framework for teacher education or ncfte 2021 will be formulated by ncte which will be done in consultation with ncert and the idea is that by 2030 the minimum degree qualification for teaching will be a four year integrated bed degree and one of the highlighting features of this particular policy dealing with the school education is its emphasis on the language of instruction and that shall be mother tongue which will be made compulsory for instruction method for teaching up to at least grade 5 and also the national education policy clearly highlights that no language will be imposed on any student so now you can understand that how important was the inclusion of these issues into national education policy of course not only these steps will enable better learning outcomes for our children but at the same time they are going to go a long way in assuaging the doubts of a lot of regional political parties so these are the important provisions dealing with the reforms which has to be brought about in school education through NEP 2020 this next news item four year ug courses in and fill out in new education policy appears on page number 1 and it talks about the reforms which have been brought in national education policy 2020 in the field of higher education so let us now discuss these provisions under higher education sector the government wants to increase gross enrollment ratio to 50% by 2035 and for that 3.5 crore seats are to be added in our higher education sector now one of the long standing problem of higher education in india has been its rigidity as well as lack of creativity in higher education now all the viewers are either in later stages of their undergraduation or might have passed them and you know that in most of the colleges and universities in our country how difficult it is to pursue multidisciplinary courses taking a simple example how difficult it is for a person to pursue few of the courses in medical as well as taking other credits from legal field or from llb courses you can obviously understand that it is unthinkable but you can also at the same time understand that if we want to have world class lawyers and legal professionals it is important that they be allowed this kind of freedom so now the higher education policy has taken the first steps towards what we are talking about the policy envisages broad based multidisciplinary holistic undergraduate education with flexible curriculum which will allow for creative combinations of subjects as well as it will allow for integration of vocational education apart from that it is going to allow for multiple entry as well as exit points into our higher education system now to make this point clear you know that for entry into any kind of academic stream you need to have certain level of qualification for example if you want to pursue technology you have to have maths as one of your majors in your higher secondary or for example if you want to pursue a certain course in post graduate you have to have similar or related undergraduate degree in order to be able to pursue that so what that does is that it creates a tunnel where if you have taken an entry at certain point only then you can achieve that destination whereas all the people who have missed this particular entry then will be devoid of any kind of opportunity in this field and hence the government is going to enable multiple entry as well as exit points also the government has come up with a very very innovative idea of academic bank of credits which shall be established to facilitate transfer of credits now first and foremost this is going to be a digital bank now you might ask a question that why is this particular bank is needed let's say if a person is pursuing her ba from a particular institute known by the name of i and under the new education policy the transfer of the courses have been allowed from institute i1 to the second university i2 and if this person a wants to take a transfer from this particular institute to the another what about the kind of courses as well as the credit that she has earned already in the i1 and this bank will take care of all her higher education credits into one particular bank which she can demonstrate anywhere across the country or even the world and which shall be taken into account while her final degree is being made so this is quite a novel concept and it should be welcomed by all of us 
Now, government has also announced in the national education policy of creation of an apex body for fostering a strong research culture and building research capacity across higher education and that shall be known by the name of National Research Foundation. Obviously, you can now understand that why this was done. Now, because India's higher education institutions lag a lot when it comes to research and education creation. Most of our higher education centers work satisfactorily as far as the propagation of education is concerned. They impart education quite well, but when it comes to creating new knowledge, they lag a lot and hence the National Research Foundation is going to take care of all those things. And then finally, the most important topic is Higher Education Commission of India. The NEP paves the way for a single overarching regulator for higher education, which will replace UGC and All India Council for Technical Education. Now this single regulator, which will be called Higher Education Commission of India, will have four independent verticals to carry out the functions of regulator that shall be known by the name of National Higher Education Regulatory Council. Next vertical shall be about standard setting which shall be known by the name of General Education Council. Then Higher Education Grants Council shall handle the function of funding and National Accreditation Council shall fulfill the task of accreditation. Now if you are following current affairs, you must know that there is a draft Higher Education Commission of India repeal of University Grants Commission Act 1956 Bill 2018 which is already under consideration. So a lot of students ask doubt related to policy, acts and bills. Now you can understand that policy is like a framework which gives the direction but it does not have any kind of legal backing behind it. And after the policy has been laid out, various acts and executive orders are given out by the government to actually implement various provisions of the policy. The national education policy will also do away the distinction between private and public sector colleges as far as regulation, standard setting and accreditation is concerned. Of course, there will remain differences in funding and finally other provisions also. Starting with National Educational Technology Forum which shall be an autonomous body which will be created to provide a platform for free exchange of ideas on the use of technology to enhance learning, assessment, planning and administration. Now next, Gender Inclusion Fund is very very important and also very innovative. National Education Policy 2020 emphasizes setting up of Gender Inclusion Fund as well as Special Education Zones for disadvantaged regions and groups. What it will do, how these provisions shall be utilized will become clear in successive days as more and more details emerge out of National Education Policy 2020. And finally, and easily one of the most debatable provision which has been included in this particular policy is that it paves the way for entry of foreign university into our country. Although the foreign education institutions regulation of entry and operation bill was laid down in the parliament in 2010 and since then this topic has been in news. Now the national education policy states that the world's top 100 universities shall be facilitated to operate in the country through a new law. So obviously the government must have planned for a new law which shall enable the entry of foreign universities in our campus. And you are going to see a lot of editorials appearing in the Hindu in coming days on matters which will support this provision as well as oppose this provision. So get ready to make extensive notes on these topics. So this is it as far as the discussion on National Education Policy 2020 is concerned. All these notes shall be provided in the PDF in the form of screenshot. Try to memorize them, especially the constitutional provisions and the key features of National Education Policy 2020. Now this article AIIB to look at India's project proposals from economic view, page number 14. Now, despite the border standoff with China, India has continued to remain the largest beneficiaries of developmental loans from China-backed Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or acronymed as AIIB. So far, India has received around $4.35 billion from AIIB. Mr. Jin Lee Kuan, who has been recently re-elected as president of AIIB, has highlighted that AIIB would continue to function as an apolitical institution and will continue to support projects in India. So the topic of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank becomes important from the perspective of both prelims as well as mains examination. Now this particular topic is important from the perspective of both prelims as well as mains perspective. 
Now, as far as prelims is concerned, it is important to understand the establishment, number of members, membership open to which of the countries, total authorized capital and voting weightages of various members. In this regard, there is an image which compares both the New Development Bank as well as Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank with each other on these criteria. It is recommended that you go through it because it is important as UPNC has already asked similar questions in 2015 and 19. Just to give you a hint as to how questions are formed in UPSC, in 2015, UPSC had asked, the Fortaleza declaration recently in news is related to the affairs of, and the right answer is B, BRICS. Whereas in 2019, UPSC asked, with reference to Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, consider the following statements. Statement 1, AIIB has more than 80 member nations, which is correct. Statement 2 is incorrect. India is not the largest shareholder in AIIB. Now it's your job to find out which country is the largest shareholder in AIIB. And the third statement is also incorrect because AIIB indeed has a lot of members from outside Asia and most of them from Africa as well. So the right answer is A1 only. Now moving on to the mains perspective of AIIB. Why was AIIB established? Where was the need for AIIB when already similar institutions and that to a lot powerful institutions like IMF and World Bank and Asian Development Bank exists? Now this emergence of AIIB is a reflection of changing political as well as economic equation across globe. So if you want to segregate the potential of AIIB into economic and political, to start with, China is sitting on a huge pile of unutilized cash and is looking for markets to invest so that it can earn a higher interest. Now, AIIB will serve one of this most important function for China. Also, you must be knowing that Yuan has got entry into SDR. Now, you should also know that what are the other countries under SDR. Now, just entry into SDR is not going to make Yuan a global currency. But that currency should also have global acceptability. Now, since under AIIB, China is going to loan in Yuan, obviously increasing participation in AIIB will obviously increase the global acceptability of Yuan and hence it can become a rival to dollar in this way. The power of dollar does not come from the fact that it is American currency, but it comes from the fact that it is applicable globally. And once you accept dollar, you are sure that anywhere across the world you go, you can exchange it. Also, you should know the fact that being one of the most poorest region of the world, Asia and Africa's needs for infrastructure development are massive. And countries in these regions feel that they are not being served by these global institutions. Since the investment focus of AIIB will be sector and region specific, unlike IMF and ADB, AIIB has a lot of potential to be a financial enabler, especially for Asia and Africa region. So this is about economics of AIIB, that where does the need comes from as far as the AIIB is concerned. But there is just not economics, there is also a politics. And the political reasons for the emergence or genesis of AIIB can be segregated into two parts. Now number one is that unlike IMF, AIIB does not adopt quota system. That is, decision making power is not proportionate to contribution and hence it is quite democratic. Obviously, you may laugh that China and democracy do not go hand in hand. Obviously, the interests of the China will be supreme, but as it wants to gain influence in Asia and Africa, it will try to ensure that the funding of the projects is as apolitical and is based on demands. And the second important reason for the conceptualization of AIIB is the way IMF, ADB and World Bank condition their loans. Now, if you focus on this part of the discussion, it will be also helpful when you have to talk or write about demerits of IMF and World Bank. Now, you must have read the newspaper that whenever IMF extends a loan, it wants certain conditions to be satisfied by the receiving country. For example, they will force the countries to adopt freer and freer market, which means that they will force to liberalize, privatize as well as globalize which developing countries are often reluctant to do, but they have to do if they have to get the loan. Then they impose structural reforms. Also, the loans are often conditioned on increasing the stringency of intellectual property right laws in the domestic country. And in the recent years, they have adopted a lot of green conditions. For example, these institutions have declared that they are not going to fund any project which deals with the mining of coal 
or any other kind of non renewable energy source also they are increasingly adopting environment impact assessment as the condition to provide loan now you can think a scenario of africa and india obviously they are countries with one of the largest natural resources of coal and oil and petroleum and if these institutions dominated by developed countries are going to deny funding on environmental terms obviously the countries of this region are not going to be happy and that is where the opportunity of aiib comes as it has openly declared that they are not going to look into green norms for extending the funds so so far so good everything looks fine and good for aiib but it is not so it is also facing a lot of challenges and we will now see what challenges does it face now the first and the foremost issue which the aiib is facing and will continue to face is the non participation of both usa and japan in it now the united states and japan remain very very non committed to aiib although there is no denying the fact that aiib will probably survive and function well without the participation of us and japan but the matter of the fact is that when the largest economy in the world and most advanced economy in asia don't participate in a particular project obviously it dents the credibility then in past 5 to 10 years China has ruffled the feathers of almost all its neighbors and hence it has seen worsening relationship with almost all the neighbors barring the exception of Pakistan it has soured its relationship with Japan there is no need to elaborate on how the relationship between India and China has gone sour and almost all the countries of south china sea are increasingly feeling the heat of china's island occupations so obviously all these countries are participants in aiib and if china continues to pursue aggressive expansionist policy of land grab then the future of the aiib is under threat then the biggest problem for aiib comes from security issues for example most of the loans which have been extended from aiib are projects in central asia and africa and at the same time we also know that these are world's most unstable regions once the projects are complete security lies in the hands of local government which often do not have capacity to prevent the insurgents and militias from the destruction and finally that aspect of aiib which has been in news in last 5 years mainly due to the performance of gwadar port and hamban tota port both of them although conceptualized and hyped as watershed moment in respective countries infrastructural paradigm proved to be utter failure because it was believed that once you develop an infra it will lead to kick starting of the economy of a region you should know that infra and economy reinforce each other you invest in infra gives a boost to economy which requires further infrastructure which you develop and then this circle goes on but in case of gwadar and hamban tota the loans extended by china to these countries were so massive that even though these projects were completed on time and they are no doubt world class facilities but these two countries simply do not have the supply and demand to match up to the expectations level and to enable these countries to repay these loans because of which you should know that sri lanka has handed over hamban tota port back to china so in a way china has a possession of a very very strategic asset few kilometers away from indian borders so now other countries are now seeing what has happened to gwadar and hamban tota first china extended massive loans built infrastructure but these infrastructure could not kick start the economy and the revenues of the infrastructure were not able to pay back the loans and now either these projects are lying idle or these projects have been completely handed over to the china this has lowered the enthusiasm of other participants as far as their reliance on aiib is concerned two editorials appearing in today's newspaper a quest for order amid cyber insecurity and shaping the digital world appear on page number 6 and 7 respectively and both of them talk about the governance of internet today of the many fundamental changes the covid-19 pandemic has elicited the profound has been the use of cyberspace while the cyberspace has enabled new modes of digital interaction like work from home which we all are doing it is also becoming increasingly vulnerable to attacks even the state sponsored ones on one hand china and russia have been blamed for such state sponsored attacks for instance in australia uk and us on the other hand governments across the world have imposed restrictions and ban on technology products like the recent 
ban on apps in India, 5G technology roll out in UK and US. So while national laws have been evoked to protect the domestic assets, given the cross-border nature of internet and digital technologies, the need for a global framework to govern the internet is desperately felt to keep the cyberspace secure. So starting with the basic question, what is internet governance? So it basically refers to rules, policies and standards that coordinate and shape the global cyberspace. And to your utter surprise, currently there is no such global internet governance framework. Now if we talk about that, why is there even a need for internet governance? And that comes and that comes from cross-border nature, the power struggle, especially between the superpowers, the fact that we want equitable use of internet, and finally, the lack of uniform cyber laws. So as far as reach is concerned, you can see that India, you can see that internet has fundamentally changed the social, economic, and political milieu of the world by its sheer reach. And it has also enabled one country to shape activities in another. For example, Arab Spring was triggered by social media platforms owned by US companies like Twitter. Also the fact that the basic nature of the internet is cross-border. Data is seen as this new engine of growth and thus where the data is produced or who owns the data for that purpose have a significant impact on the economies. Because obviously the country which will own the data shall command all the revenues. Further, the increasing deployment of digital technology has made the critical infrastructure of countries increasingly vulnerable to attacks and especially from across the borders. If we are going to adopt digital technologies in let's say grid management, then obviously our electricity supply depends upon how secure our internet is, right? Then internet is used by state as well as non-state actors of one country to influence political and social life of another. And the best example is the election of Donald Trump, which had brought so much of controversy as to Russian influence in the matters of election. So while the use of internet for the development was discussed as early as in 1998 in the UN, there is currently no consensus among the countries with regard to what constitutes internet governance. And finally, given the cross-border nature of data flow, countries lack jurisdiction over another. And since they lack jurisdiction over another country, it is important that there should be a uniform set of framework which governs the internet across the globe. So if we talk about the current status, for the first time the issue of internet was discussed at the UN platform in 1998 as we have discussed already. Accordingly, the UN then set up a mechanism called Group of Governmental Experts to discuss the issue of internet governance. However, the problem is that this body has limited membership and hence it has proven quite ineffective. And hence for the first time in 2019, it was broadened into open-ended working group which includes 193 members. So currently there are two competing views on internet governance. So the developed countries like US, UK, Australia, New Zealand and Canada want a common rule-based international order in cyberspace. Now this rule-based order is aimed at holding countries accountable for meddling with socio-political life of another country which can be read as an indication for Russia. And they also want to hold countries accountable for using ideas and data of another country and thereby they want to cripple fair competition in global economy which can be read as meant for China. On the other hand, state sovereignty approach is espoused by Russia and China which want an internet governance framework that provides national governments the power to impose curbs within the national boundaries in order to maintain stability. So they want to put their own government into the center of the internet governance. So that's why it's state sovereignty approach. This according to them is necessary to arrest the tendency of western powers to meddle in their domestic affairs, for example Hong Kong protests. So now the question arises where does India stands? It stands with free and open secure internet or it spouses for state sovereignty approach. So India has currently followed the state sovereignty approach in case of data flow as reflected in data localization norms. And also the laws including the data protection bill 
but it remains to be seen that finally which way the internet governance will evolve and obviously just like all the global matters it will take some time so these are the aspects of global governance which you should keep in mind you should also be aware of the fact that which are the group of countries which want the free and open secure internet as well as on the other hand the countries demanding state sovereignty approach now reading newspaper is about collecting solid points but also newspaper reading is a way to gather the case studies or the fodder material and the case in point is this news when the school goes to the students doorstep appearing on page number 8 where the education department of andhra pradesh has proposed a vidya varadhi scheme under which mobile classrooms equipped with audio visual gadgets will reach pockets where students do not have access to computers and interconnectivity so it can be cited as a case study in gs2 as well as you can quote this example when you are writing an essay and you have to cite few examples of innovative solutions offered by government during the crisis So the COVID-19 has come up with a unique challenge. Despite online education gaining ground, it still has many challenges to overcome, especially for students belonging to lower strata of our society who often do not have either the mobile or internet connectivity or many of them do not have both of them. And hence, the Andhra Pradesh government has proposed this solution under which first the faculties or the teachers of the schools with will categorize the students into three parts the students who have access to computers the students who have access to radio or tv sets and finally the students who do not have access to any kind of technology neither they have tv sets nor do they have computers and areas where the population of these students is significant these mobile vans which will be equipped with audio visual gadgets will reach will be positioned there and they will carry out and will carry out the education Now as far as the benefits of Vidya Varadhi scheme is concerned it obviously fulfills the obligation of RTE because now it is the fundamental right of students between the age of 6 and 14 to attain education and the number of students in the third category turns out to be around 1.2 lakh which is significant you cannot leave even a single student out of education system forget about leaving 1.2 lakh so the vehicle will reach these remote areas and impart lessons and another aspect of this particular scheme is that it can be used to provide bridge courses to the students who are out of school although they might not belong to the age group of 6 to 14 nonetheless it is important that they become literate and educated and hence this system can be utilized in future for that purpose now going forward vidya varadhi scheme can be adopted by other states to ensure education for such students who do not have access to online education during pandemic this particular news natisha of rajasthan temple returns to india appears on page number 8 natisha or a rare sandstone idol which was made in 9th century pratihar style of rajasthan is returning to india after 22 years after it was smuggled Now this Natisha icon currently at Indian High Commission in London was originally from Ghateshwar Temple Baroli in Rajasthan. Now this sandstone figurine stands tall at almost 4 feet in a rare and brilliant depiction of Shiva in the late 9th century Pratihar style. So in this context it becomes important for us to cover few of the aspects related to art and culture when we talk about Gurjar and Pratihars. Now the Gurjar or Pratihars or simply you can call them Pratihars ruled in this region of india between 8th century ce to 11th century ce one of the prominent rulers belonging to this particular dynasty are nagabhatta 1 and mihir bhoj or bhoj now nagabhatta 1 is important because his efforts were crucial in checking the arab invasion in our country the pratihars remained a strong bulwarks against arabs at the same time they also made valuable contributions in the field of art culture and commerce if we talk about art and culture the temples which they made are significant the sculptural styles used in their temples developed during this period were unique and remained an influence on later styles the nagara style of hindu temple architecture received a big big boost under their rule Now you should know that according to this style the temples were built on a stone platform with steps leading to it with many regional variations of course but the highlight of this style of temple is that of a shikhar which is a mountain like spire on top curving in the shape 
Later on, this style became very popular in northern India in the following centuries. Now, this article also gives us opportunity to revise important distinction between Dravidian as well as Nagar style of temples. Due to the lack of time, we will not be able to discuss over here, but you might be having some source of information where you can revise them. This particular article appears on page number one. Rajasthan governor gives nod to house session from August 14. Now there has been a lot of discussion as to the powers of governor and especially with respect to the aid and advice of council of ministers. So in this regard it is important to know few of the articles of our constitution and we have already covered this topic in DNS dated 26th of July 2020 where Mehak Ma'am had discussed the constitutional provisions dealing with the powers of the governor. In the same discussion, she had also discussed the discretionary power of the governor which are given in the constitution and also which arrived due to special situational circumstances. Now a lot of you ask about the links for these DNSs. You just have to go to the YouTube search option and type DNS 26 July 2020 and this video will appear. Although we will give the link as well. Then another article appears on page number one, which says that serological surveys show COVID-19 peak far away. In this regard, the details of serological survey which were conducted in Delhi has already been discussed by Mehak Ma'am in DNS dated 26th of July 2020. In that, she discussed what serological surveys are. So basically, serological surveys are antibody tests which are conducted on a large sample size. Now you know that once a person is infected by a particular virus, antibodies appear in that person's serum or the blood and they remain in the person's body for a very very long time and if you test the person within that time range, you will get antibodies specific for that particular viral infection and in that way, you can diagnose whether a person was infected with a particular virus in the past or not. So it is different from RT-PCR and rapid antigen test. Because both of them look for antigens, but this one looks for antibodies and, and hence it can be conducted even after the person has been treated and has recovered. And in that particular study, it was found that around 23.48% of the population in Delhi has already been exposed to the virus, which is quite significantly higher than the number of data which has been reported. And similar results have come for Mumbai as well where half of the people tested in Mumbai slums came out to be positive on antibody test of SARS-CoV-2, which shows that more than half of the people have been exposed. But on the other hand, only 16% of those tested in residential societies have come out positive. So it can be said that significant population of slums have been infected and there are chances of peaking and herd immunity within those slums but outside those slums a very very small population has been infected so far then the editorial appearing on page number six trouble in nepal talks about the internal politics of nepal and its impact on its relationship with india now in this regard it needs to be said that the boundary dispute which has worsened the relationship between nepal and india has already been discussed by me in DNS dated 12th of May 2020 in which we discussed the main issue related to Kalapani. We had a discussion about Treaty of Sogoli which was signed between Kingdom of Nepal and British India in 1816 that is about 200 years ago in which the boundary was set as the Kali River. Now the problem is that from where the Kali River originates was not decided at that point of time but later on it became the linchpin of the dispute because in the higher reaches of Himalayas, it becomes very difficult to trace where exactly the river emerges and depending upon where you decide to mark the exact origination point, the boundary between India and Nepal will vary according to that and that has led to a lot of dispute between India and Nepal, especially since Nepal has published its official map and it has decided to include a huge territory belonging to India into its own map.